All right. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, edition of the PolyPlay webinar. Uh, today we have two great sp speakers, and up first is uh, Dr. Brian Husband. Uh, Brian is a professor and researcher in the College of Biological Science at the University of Guelph. Uh, his research group investigates the ecology, genetics, and reproductive biology of plant populations to advance our understanding of evolutionary processes uh, and their application to conservation biology and agriculture. Uh, since unexpectedly encountering ploidy variation in his postdoctoral study system, he has developed a long standing interest in the ecology and evolutionary dynamics of polyploidy. His lab has investigated a range of topics re related to the formation and establishment of polyploids, including unreduced gamete production, mating system evolution, heteroploidy, hybridization, phenotypic evolution, and reproductive isolation. And today, Brian's going to tell us uh, about recent work in his group on interspecific variation in response to whole genome duplication, uh, insights into the adaptive significance of polyploids. With that, I'll let Brian take it away. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate today and for everyone who's attending. Uh, today, I wanted to kind of take a, I wanted to share some sort of exploratory results uh, that I'm, I'm kind of working through at the moment that I think have important implications for the way we think about polyploid evolution, especially at the, the micro evolutionary scale. Um, some of you may have uh, seen a few publications come out from the lab related to endopolyploidy and its relationship to phenotype and to, and to whole organism polyploidy. This, uh, what I'm going to share today, is actually kind of a precursor to all of that uh, that has yet to, to see the light of a publication, and I blame the pandemic on that. And I'm trying to advance my slides. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I, I don't need to provide an introductory slide to polyploidy for this group, but suffice it to say that, um, you know, I have a long-standing interest in the causes and consequences of polyploidy in plant populations. I have words about my own interests here uh, and trying to introduce polyploidy at the same time, just to say that, you know, my, my long-standing interest in polyploidy primarily focuses on auto polyploids, and we've done that deliberately because uh, we're primarily interested in kind of isolating the effects of whole genome duplications and, and, and avoiding the, the confounding effects of hybridization. And, and most of the work that I've done over the years, I think, is driven by our interest, you know, not just in the prevalence of polyploidy in flowering plants, but especially uh, the patterns of variation uh, among species and even within species is probably where most of our effort has gone. And there's lots of interesting uh, evidence to, to support the, the prevalence, but also the variable incidence of polyploidy at that level. Uh, the work that I was going to share today actually is, is, is the product of some kind of wide-ranging discussions that we had in the lab uh, several years ago, talking about the adaptive significance of polyploidy. And, and what we were kind of amusing about was the fact that, um, the, that in many cases, you know, since, since the, the first descriptions of polyploidy in the early 1900s, researchers have tried to identify, you know, the reasons why polyploidy is so successful. And uh, often the approach is to attribute the success of polyploidy to a sort of subset of traits that are particularly commonly associated with extant polyploids uh, that we think might confer some kind of a fitness advantage. And, and you see that time and time again in the literature. And the, the traits that are often associated with the success of polyploids is sort of eventually uh, linked to uh, increased cell size, which often is uh, associated with whole genome duplications. And some of those traits include what I've listed here, increased size of the whole body of the organism, delayed development, increased stress tolerance, often drought or cold tolerance are attributed to, to polyploidy and increased ecological amplitude and geographic breadth. And these are sort of frequently invoked when trying to explain the, the frequency of polyploidy in different taxonomic groups or over time. And I, I think that has some real heuristic values, but it, but it also, I think, has some limitations. And a couple of those are, first of all, that uh, the, the extant polyploids on, upon which we've based some of these associations may not actually reflect the direct effects of whole genome duplication. They're in fact conflated with evolutionary change that's, that occurs subsequent to the whole genome duplication. 
Uh, here's an example here using uh, one of my main study organisms, Chimerian angustifolium, uh, where we've sort of depicted the phenotypes in, a, in multivariate space here for tetraploids, synthesized neotetraploids and diploids. And you can see that in, in a case like this, based on a large number of different phenotypic traits, that the tetraploids are almost as divergent from the newly synthesized polyploids as they are from the diploid progenitors. And uh, we see this sort of a pattern in, in many other attributes as well. The other issue is, of course, that when you start to take a look at the variability within some of these key characters, key traits that we often use for ascribing uh, adaptive significance, when you look at them uh, through the literature, we often encounter a pretty enormous amount of variability uh, in those traits. Uh, here's an example, uh, again, from our own work, where we were trying to test the prediction that polyploids should have larger geographic ranges and, and broader ecological amplitude than diploids, something that's frequently argued in the literature. And uh, so in this particular case, we looked at the differential of, of geographic range sizes between diploids and polyploid congeners in the same genus for 144 different genera. And this just sort of, I think, illustrates my point that the variability that we see in a trait like that is massive. And we've depicted it here as just the differential uh, standardized uh, in standard deviation units between uh, diploids and their polyploid progenitors, with the far left indicating uh, cases where the polyploids have smaller geographic ranges than the diploids, all the way to the far right, where it's the reverse. So an enormous amount of variability, and we see this in a lot of other important characters, flowering time, um, ecological amplitude, um, uh, some, sometimes developmental rates and, and phenology in flowering plant populations. So a lot of patterns like this across many different characters. And so what we started to realize is that maybe we were asking the wrong question and that we should be capitalizing on that variability to ask, first of all, how uniform are the phenotypic effects of replicated whole genome duplication events when that's conducted across different genetic backgrounds? So this is something we have a hard time extracting from the literature because it's so case-based. Um, so we were really interested in exploring kind of how repeatable and how uniform that is when we can control the genetic background and when we can control the the whole genome duplication events. And we present a couple of models here. One would be what we call the additive model where the whole genome duplication has a uniform effect on multiple genotypes, uh, regardless of their genetic background. And then the uh, alternative is um, a non-additive model where the impacts of whole genome duplication are highly variable and uh, specific to particular genetic backgrounds. So there's no uniformity in, in that effect. And then secondly, so, so we can use that to start to understand why there is so much variability in the effects of whole genome duplication. And then that sets up the opportunity to start to ask, well, what are the factors that ultimately determine the magnitude and the direction of a response? Can we start to kind of get into that level of detail and, and hoping to understand what's going on? So specifically in our case, we are wondering whether the phenotype and whether the genotype of the diploid progenitor in some way can be used to predict what the impact of the whole genome duplication is actually going to be. And this is just one simple of exa example where that where the, the, the phenotype of the diploid might actually be related in some way to the whole genome duplication effect. So what we did in this case is uh, basically we conducted uh, or synthesized whole, uh, whole genome duplications in 20, uh, 45 different diploid genotypes of Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, these are taken uh, from, were collected from across Europe and Asia uh, and from the 1001 Genome Project. And in this uh, case, what we did is relatively simple, um, but basically we started with one, 100 diploid genotypes. We used colchicine to create two different cytotypes, a diploid, that is uh, individuals that were treated with colchicine, but remained as diploid, so did not convert, and tetraploids, those that uh, did convert from diploid to tetraploidy, 
we ended up with 96 uh, different accessions or genotypes that, that we had both of these cytotypes. And then we reduced that down to 45, which included uh, those genotypes where we had two independent uh, diploid treated, but uh, diploid cytotypes and two independent stems that converted from diploid to tetraploid for each genotype. Um, and we then grew those in a common environment um, with eight replicas for each cytotype per genotype. And so what I wanted to do today was just sort of show you a little bit about what's come from that. Uh, so in this case, basically, we, we grew them in a common environment. Uh, in this case, there were 10 different phenotypes that were monitored. We've actually tracked a whole lot of more traits, including some functional traits. Um, but I'm going to talk about 10 phenotypic traits today that are growth or reproductive traits. And we also um, uh, quantified them kind of multi in multivariate space using prin principal component analysis. We measured at the same time uh, the genome size for all of the individuals within this experiment to confirm that the, uh, the, the whole genome duplication events that we synthesized were stable. And we also estimated the degree of leaf endopolyploidy, so the degree to which individual cells or cell lines within the leaf underwent additional uh, genome duplications above the 2C level. So basically this index is like a weighted average of the number of duplications that are occurring above the 2C level within the leaf tissue. And we also quantified uh, using uh, world climb, a number of climatic variables, plus some principal components for those environmental variables uh, for the sites from which the individual Arabidopsis were collected. So here's a snapshot, and I'm conscious now of the time that I've eaten up. So, uh, Mike, I'll rely on you to holler when I when you have to give me the hook. Um, so first of all, this is just to show you that the DNA content was, uh, as you would expect it would be, the diploids had half the DNA content of the tetraploids. They were stable in this respect. We did find some chimeric uh, genotypes, and those were not included in this experiment, but these ones were completely stable. And in fact, there was no ploidy by genotype interaction. The ratio of DNA content was constant across all 45 of the different uh, cytotypes. First uh, thing I'll show you is just kind of a, a, a kind of a backgrounder, which is to say that we started by looking at the phenotypic variation for all ten of the traits and for the principal components uh, just in the diploids. And for nine of those ten traits plus both principal components, we see significant variation. This just gives you a kind of glimpse at what that variation looks like. I'll probably be using rosette diameter and days to flower repeatedly as a, as a way to give you a glimpse into the real data. Um, but you can see here a lot of variability. And I've also highlighted Columbia down at the bottom, the genotype that's probably one of the most widely used uh, for lab uh, molecular genetic uh, research, just to show you it for a comparison with many of these wild types that are collected uh, from Eurasia. And now we can start to think or look at what happens when you synthesize the polyploids. Uh, the first thing is, of course, that the whole genome duplication has significant effects on all traits and all principal component variables uh, in this particular experiment. And the this graph is just meant to show you the differential between tetraploid and diploid for those for the, the phenotypic traits. Uh, you can see half of them, uh, in half of the cases, the tetraploids have higher phenotypic values than the diploids on average. And uh, for the other half, it's the reverse. So we're seeing uh, a lot of variability even there for traits, many of which are kind of size-related traits. So we see some variability here already. Now, what matters most is kind of when we get into the, a little bit more of the detail. And I'll start by just saying that this, this figure is not meant to, we're not going to get into it in a lot of detail, but suffice it to say that uh, in each one of these panels, we're, we're basically looking at what the impact of the whole genome duplication is for each of the individual genotypes. Each line is an individual genotype, and there's a significant genotype by ploidy interaction for every one of these uh, phenotypes, as well as for the PCA variables. And I can give you a close-up 
glimpse of that, uh, again, looking at these variables. So you can see rosette diameter, it's all over the place. We have individual genotypes that show increases in uh, value across their replicate gene uh, individuals. Some show dramatic decreases and some so uh, very little uh, change with whole genome duplication at all. The same is true for days to flower, although the pattern is a little bit different. We, we tend to see a group of individuals towards the bottom that are basically showing very little response to whole genome duplication, in some cases even a slightly negative response, and then a, a larger swath of genotypes that are all showing increases in the time to flower with whole genome duplication, although the degree of that change does vary quite a bit. And then lastly, seed size is probably the one trait that's most similar to the pure additive model in that uh, whole genome duplication is causing a relatively similar change in seed size. And in this case, this is measured as seed surface area, not uh, as seed mass. Um, but you can see the impact of the whole genome duplication is relatively similar, although there is still a genotype by ploidy interaction uh, with this trait as well. So all told, if we look at the sources of phenotypic variants uh, for these different traits, um, uh, the seed size is the outlier. All the other traits, the predominant, most of the variance is attributable to genotype variation within ploidy. Uh, with a, a smaller amount attributable to ploidy. And the differences between the independently generated diploid and tetraploid lines within a genotype is actually relatively small, but does vary significantly uh, among the different uh, phenotypic traits. The next result that's kind of interesting is that when we then quantify the effect size for whole genome duplication for each genotype and relate that now we're trying to understand whether there's anything uh, predictable about what that whole genome duplication effect is. And here we find that there's a strong relationship, most often negative, between the whole genome duplication effect size and the original phenotype of the diploids that we, that we used uh, of the 45 genotypes that we used. So for example, you, you can see the rosette diameter is the first upper panel and then degree of flowering is the next one. I'm going to zoom to those now and let you see those in a little more detail. Uh, so here again, the, what we see is uh, again, the, the X, uh, sorry, the Y axis is the effect size now. It's describing the, the change uh, between the two ploidy levels. And we see that when Genotypes produce small rosette diameters as diploids. They tend to produce positive effects of whole genome duplication. Um, as the rosette diameter in the diploids increases, we see a declining impact of whole genome duplication. And that it, it, at the point where it crosses the zero uh, line is where the, the, the tetraploid and diploids have similar uh, phenotypes. And then as the rosette di diameter increases, we see now a negative impact of whole genome duplication uh, on rosette diameter. And the same kind of pattern is true for days to flower, although it looks a little bit different. Here, we have a cluster of genotypes uh, that have fairly neutral effects of whole genome duplication, or in a few cases, slightly negative. And, then, and, and those are all genotypes that flower relatively quickly, relatively early. And as flowering time increases in genotypes, we see an increasingly large impact of whole genome duplication. So I think, I think this is interesting to me because it suggests there's something about that diploid condition that's influencing what the impact is going to be. I don't fully understand it yet, but uh, now as an aside, um, I did want to throw in one slide about endopolyploidy. Uh, in some of the papers we've published previously, we talk about the so-called trade-off that seems to exist between the degree of endopolyploidy and, and the impacts of whole genome duplication. Uh, actually, yeah, in those papers, it's the reverse. But here, what we're, we're showing is the same trade-off, and that is that genotypes, when in the diploid form, if they have relatively little endopolyploidy, they are the genotypes that experience the greatest impact of whole genome duplication, and it's a positive impact. As endopolyploidy increases in genotypes of the diploids, uh, we see a decline in the impact of whole genome duplication, and as it, that continues, uh, we actually see a negative impact of whole genome duplication on, on the effect size. This result is for rosette size. We see this for a number of other traits as well.
So that's kind of curious. And, and it does, again, suggest some sort of a constraint that is operating, perhaps, that, that prevents um, the whole genome duplication from acting in, in a positive way when the, when the degree of endoploidy is already high. And then lastly, the, the other point that I wanted to, um, to show you is now what we take is the, we, we're interested in examining the whole genome duplication effect size and relating that to the environment from which the diploids were originally collected. So I've taken a bit of a shortcut here and I'm showing you basically four panels um, and what they're doing is relating the two principal components for environment, which are listed as EPC1 and EPC2, and comparing that to the principal components for phenotype. Uh, and, and, and this is basically the result is the same for all four of these in that the relationship between phenotype and environment is statistically significant in all of these cases. Um, the two lines that we show actually show you the, the relationship for diploids, that's the solid line, and the uh, dashed lines are for the tetraploids from which we that we've derived from those diploids. And you can see that the relationships are similar, although they are not the same. So especially the two with asterisks, uh, in th both of those cases, we see uh, a, a, an environment by ploidy interaction, so the relationship um, between diploids and environment is not the same as the relationship between tetraploids uh, and environment. And in fact, in those two cases, what it's telling us is that the effect size of whole genome duplication changes over the course of those environmental um, of those environmental variables. So in EPC1 and, and PC1, uh, EPC2 and PC2, there is a change in the effect size with environment that we're seeing. Now, this just gives you another kind of a snapshot of that, but I've isolated a specific um, a, a specific set of variables. So this quantifies the, on the y-axis is the effect size, uh, which is actually a principal component that we've generated in itself uh, based on all the different phenotypes that we measured. And it shows the relationship between that principal component of effect size and mean annual temperature. Um, that was negatively uh, related to, to mean annual temperature. It was positively about weekly related to potential evapotranspiration uh, for this same, this same PC2. Uh, but I just wanted you to see kind of what it looks like. There's quite a bit of slop in the very in the in the, the relationship, um, but there is a significant relationship nonetheless. So um, basically, that, that was kind of what I wanted to share today. Uh, I, uh, the summary, the big message to me is really the, 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 what really surprised us was the degree to which whole genome du duplication effect size varies in magnitude and direction um, among plants of different genetic background. Uh, this kind of raises questions about scale and, and is this a phenomena that we see um, strictly, you know, among genotypes within species and can we expect a similar kinds of patterns when we start to scale up to population or species level kinds of patterns. Um, and, and I guess the first thing, the first reaction that we had when we saw this was, wow, this suggests that there's massive opportunities for selection to operate on the impacts of whole genome duplication. Uh, and that, you know, we have to be careful when drawing conclusions about what the effect of whole genome duplication is in any one case, because it appears to be so dependent on that genetic background. Uh, and that sets up this possibility for many different evolutionary trajectories for whole genome duplication um, based on the variability that exists within species. And of course, that assumes that tetraploids or polyploids are being generated multiple times within species, uh, and that can generate this variability upon which selection can act. Uh, the, the last point that I wanted to make was just, I think it reminds us that not all the genotypes are predisposed to producing polyploids that are very divergent from themselves. Um, and so the data suggests that the likelihood of polyploid establishment uh, may be very uneven uh, across the genotypes that are in the within the geographic range of any given species. And because of the relationship between genotype and environment, uh, 
uh, it's likely that different regions or different locations within the geographic range are predisposed to producing highly divergent polyploids, which might in turn increase the likelihood of establishment in those places. So it kind of gives us a, a very a micro sort of species level perspective on how polyploidy might evolve. And then lastly, I'll just um, end by saying that, you know, we, we are continuing to move forward on this. We have been in a holding pattern pretty much since the, the pandemic began, and now we're beginning to move forward with this again. Um, and we're particularly interested now in, in sort of looking more carefully genetically at what differentiates the low and the high effect genotypes. Uh, so the genotypes that show large impacts of whole genome duplication versus those that produce small effects. And we're ta tackling that a couple of different ways. The first and th that we have already been working on is by looking at flowering time as a specific trait of interest and asking you know, which genes in the flowering time pathways are influenced by whole genome duplication and are um, perhaps distinguishing the groups that show no change in flowering time with whole genome duplication from those that show a massive increase in the time to flowering with whole genome duplication. And, and what is it about the diploids that show big effects of whole genome duplication on flowering time that differentiate them uh, from those that don't? And then the last, and uh, I think I, I see Julia on there, and we've certainly had conversations about this, and my thinking on this has evolved a little bit uh, over time, but what, where we're going now with this is we finally have some funding to work on this and start looking at um, at genotypes that whose multivariate phenotype shows little change in whole genome duplication versus those that show big, and we can uh, create a recombinant inbred lines uh, for those uh, different combinations of genotypes and begin to use some genome association mapping to begin to understand what aspects of the genome are, are associated with those, those differences. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you to a few other people in the lab that helped so much with this. And, uh, and I'm delighted to entertain any questions. And once again, I apologize for that problem at the beginning there. No worries. Thank you so much, Brian. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to let the audience take them first. And then I, I think we'll have time for a, a couple of questions just with the sort of the little delay there, and then we'll jump into the next talk. So it uh, looks like Brittany's hand is up first. So go ahead, Brittany. Um, thanks. Uh, so great talk, Brian. This is very interesting um, information. I'm looking forward to see where it goes. But um, I may have missed this at the beginning, but the, all of the analyses you all did on on phenotype and everything were those from the plants that were directly treated with colchicine, like the first generation, I guess. Yes, the first generation were the diploids and tetraploids that we used for each genotype were all treated with colchicine. Okay. I'm wondering if you all are planning on doing any kind of follow ups with later generations because I know you know there have been some papers out that show that gene expression in neopolyploids can vary pretty wildly in the first ge few generations and then oftentimes can kind of like settle out. So I was wondering if there was a right. plan to, you know, look at, and in Arabidopsis, this seems like it would be fairly easy to do since they self pretty readily, but yeah, yes. do you have any plans to, to look yeah. at them later on down the road? Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, we have not done that. Uh, again, everything kind of went on pause for us, but uh, we we are testing the seed uh, viability as we speak to make sure that we are we're good to go, and then we're we're hoping to to look at um, some of the things I've described so far. But very interested in looking at yeah, what happens over time as well. It's a sort of a a slightly different question, but it does create real opportunities for looking at any kind of genomic uh, shifts or adjustments that might occur after whole genome duplication uh, across generations. And I think this would be a great system for doing that in. Cool. Thanks. All right. I think uh, Julia was up next. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Brian. That was a really fun talk. Um, so it was really striking to see the association with the magnitude of the response to whole genome duplication and environment broadly, like for, it looked like it was from multiple, you know, it was like NPC space. And so I guess yes. to me yeah. that implies, you know, climate adaptation is probably super polygenic. And yet you see this like trade-off with uh, climate and the effect of whole genome duplication. Like, is that how you're thinking of it? Like past adaptation uh, might predispose some plants to, like to climate to be more or less tolerant to 
polypody. I mean, I'm just trying to wrap my head around like the implications of, of that association. Is it? Yeah, I guess um, I'm not sure if I'm following your question, Julia, but I think um, the way we were thinking about it first was just there does seem to be, you know, through an adaptive process, some kind of matching of genotypes with environment of the samples that we've originally worked with. But then the next question becomes when those individual genotypes undergo a whole genome duplication, uh, in some cases, um, well, the, the basically what you get is is somewhat predictable that, you know, that once you know what the phenotype is that you're looking at, you can kind of guess or estimate where the, the effect of whole genome duplication is going to be large and where it's going to be minimal. Whether those polyploids are well adapted to those local environments is mm -hmm. something we just can't, we can't I know. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the, 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 the data that we had that, that showed a relationship between the phenotype of tetraploids and that of uh, the and the environment suggests that there there is going to be a change that some in some cases the polyploids might not be well suited to those same environments, and so the the big question for us is, yeah, how likely is it that those polyploids will establish? I'm pretty sure that polyploids produced throughout the range are not going to have equal likelihood of establishing, and and but but we don't really have very concrete information about that. Super interesting. Yeah, I think I was also thinking about it in terms of the arc genetic architecture of like climate adaptation. If it if that you presume is polygenic, then maybe there's a lot of genes involved in how on this response to whole genome duplication. And I think some of your follow up right. work could be really cool in in testing that. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> Thanks. All right, I know there are two other questions, but I think just to try to keep us on time for Hannes, um, let's save those to the end. <laughs> so Sritama and, and, and Rob, we'll, get, we'll come back to you, okay? <laughs> just wanna keep it moving. And, um, and I'll, but that was, I have some questions too, Brian. I, I'll ask those at the end as well. Um, really cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get going with our, our second talk here. All right, from uh, Hannes Becker. Uh, Hannes is a population geneticist um, who uh, originally uh, did his PhD on hybridization in grasshoppers in the, in the French Alps with Richard Nichols, followed by a postdoc uh, with Alex Twyford on ecological speciation in parasitic British eyebright eye plants of varying ploidy levels and uh, where he saw the light of polyploidy. Um, currently, he is working as a statistician at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and he is interested in evolutionary genomics, bryophytes, and methods development. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Hannes take it away and, and tell us about variation in composition and genome size and composition uh, explored with K-MER spectra. All right. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me, Mike. It's great to be here. And thanks, Brian, for your talk. That, that was really fascinating, and I have several questions as well. Um, so, yeah, this talk here is a bit more technical. I hope it doesn't bore you, but I've, I've seen in this seminar series, there were several camera talks, and so I thought maybe this fits in quite well here, yeah, hopefully. So first of all, I want to thank some people. Um, this all started when I was doing a postdoc with Alex Twyford at Edinburgh, and Alex is a really great guy in whose lab really interesting things are done. Um, both uh, field studies, field experiments, common garden experiments, uh, but also uh, population genetics and population genomics work. And in particular, current PhD student Ding and past PhD student uh, Max uh, were very helpful in this work. And here are some funders and organizations that were very helpful during my postdoc. And um, so this postdoc was. Um, on Euphrasia, um, the genus of eyebrights, which are in the family of your Orobacaceae. They are hemiparasites, and they're interesting for several reasons. They're distributed throughout much of the temperate regions of the world, um, and they're particularly species rich in the United Kingdom, where there are two different ploidy levels. They are phenotypically quite diverse, but um, they are not easily discernible by barcoding. So if you look at clustered barcodes, then you cannot tell apart species uh, nor ploidy levels, actually. If you look at ITS sequences, you can tell apart ploidy levels in the UK, diploids and tetraploids, uh, but still you'll struggle with the species. 
And so there are many interesting things um, to work about in hybrids. How do they interact with their hosts and so on, um, their uh, pollination biology and other things. But I was interested in their genomic relationships between the species in the UK and then the relationships between the diploids and the tetrapods. So the first part of this talk is about subgenome relationships, and that's been published a couple of years ago in the paper that we call the Feral paper, and I'll come back to that in a bit. So I told you there are tetrapoids and diploids in the UK, and if you look at only one tetrapoid and one diploid species, there are different sort of ways you can imagine that their genomes are related. Uh, the tetrapoid, if it's got two different subgenomes, an allotetraploid, um, then they might be equally diverged to one another than they are to the diploid. So you could have this uh, triangle here with three equal sides. Or you could have a situation where the tetraploid subgenomes are quite similar, maybe so similar that it's actually an allotetra, an autotetraploid, pattern, and the diploid might be more diverged from either of these. Or you might have a situation where you deal with an allotetraploid with two very diverged subgenomes, but the diploid may be actually quite similar to one of these subgenomes. And that's the sort of thing I, I wanted to find out. And I started looking into this with KMERS. Uh, now, why KMERS? Well, at the start of my postdoc, I had looked into KMER analyses and uh, came across this thing, genome profiling, which is um, what people say when they want to assess the properties of some uh, sequencing data set without looking at a genome assembly, usually. So you can look at the raw sequencing reads and turn them into KMERS and find out interesting things about the individual that you sequence without having to assemble a genome. And such KMER analyses, they're often seen as quick and dirty analyses, but um, quick they certainly are. It's certainly faster to run a KMER analysis than to assemble a genome and map reads to it and call variants. And, and I'd like to encourage you to think about them not necessarily as dirty, but as complementary to assembly-based methods. And sometimes uh, KMER methods can give you more accurate results than assembly-based methods because, well, an assembly-based method always relies on an assembly, and if that's not good, that can bias your results in various ways. And just to mention, there are two quite famous uh, genome profiling methods, uh, genome scope, which you can use to analyze a camera spectrum and to do quality control, and smudge plot, which you can use to um, estimate the ploidy level of an individual where you don't know ploidy, both based on cameras. All right, and um, many of you will know this, but a little introduction to what are cameras and what is a camera spectrum. Imagine you have a diploid genome here with two genomes, like in a, in a human or in a diploid arachidopsis, and you sequence, sequence that with short reads at about 50x coverage. And then you take all of your sequencing reads, each of your sequencing reads, and slice it into small uh, overlapping subsequences of equal length, say length 21. Then you generate 21 mass cameras of length 21. And if you do this for your whole sequencing data set, and then for each of these different cameras, you count how often do you observe it in your data set, then you'll see most of them around 50 times. You see them a bit less often, but that doesn't matter for that this talk here. So you get some sort of peak here if you plot their frequencies. Many of these cameras will be observed 50 times. But then many diploids have some degree of heterozygosity, so there'll be sites that differ between these two genomes. And if a camera overlaps one of these heterozygous sites, then this camera will be different in this genome uh, compared to that genome. So cameras overlapping with these heterozygous sites, they show at a lower um, account value, which is, by the way, also called multiplicity. Um, and then you also find cameras that are even rarer, and that's usually cameras that are due to either sequencing errors or contamination. Uh, but you can see the more heterozygous the individual is that you sequence, the higher will be this lower copy number peak here, sometimes called the heterozygous peak. And the lower will be the homozygous peak. So from the relative height of these peaks, you can tell the heterozygosity of an individual. And you can also extend that. And that's what I did during my postdoc. Uh, 
to tetraploids and polyploids in general. Now in tetraploids, heterozygosity is a bit more complicated. There are different kinds of heterozygosity possible. You might have three copies of the same allele and one that's different, or you have a 50-50 situation, or you could have three or even four different alleles if you're dealing with a tetraploid. And so a typical tetraploid KMS spectrum may look like this. This is actually a KMS spectrum generated from one of my Euphrasias, Euphrasia arctica, a tetraploid. And what you can see here is, if you know the sequencing depth, there's a 1x, a 2x, not really a 3x, but here a 4x peak, and there's a very prominent 2x peak corresponding to KMS observed twice. Um, and that corresponds to these diverged subgenomes. If you have diverged subgenomes in an allo tetraploid, then there'll be many KMS that are observed twice in these two or in those two, but fewer that are observed across all subgenomes. So these are the fewer KMS here that are seen in this 4x peak. And then, of course, you can also have heterozygosity, different KMS between uh, the copies of these subgenomes and these shown here. But it's very rare that you see a KMA that's observed across three genomes and it's different in the fourth one. So there, there isn't really a discernible sort of 3x peak here. So this is good evidence uh, to suggest that Euphrasia arctica is actually an allotetraploid. Uh, but rather than just looking at the KMA spectrum and saying this is plausible, I thought, can we actually use KMA spectrum for inference? So I came up with mathematical expectation of the shape of a KMA spectrum depending on heterozygosity and divergence between the subgenomes. So I developed an app called Tetma, it's an, an R shiny app uh, that you can download from GitHub and run locally. And you upload into it a, a KMA spectrum and it's interactive. So you can either just promise arranges and see how this red fit here compares to the data, which is shown by black dots. Or you can go into auto fitting mode and ask, um, ask Tetma to uh, spit out the uh, ideal parameters for you. Um, and so this was published in 2020 in what we call the Feral paper. And the Feral paper is about an island in the British Isles. It's the most remote but permanently inhabited island in the British Isles. And it's <laughs> really rich in Euphrasia. Uh, so there are several different eyebright species that grow there and that I studied. And I focused on these three different ones here. Um, and they grow in different regions on the island. And not only did I look into subgenome relationships, but also into phenotypic differences and whether they are due to environmental differences or whether they're heritable. But I won't talk about this today. Um, so equipped with this sort of confidence that the tetraploids are allotetraploids and that actually applied to each tetraploid that I looked at, um, I generated a sort of crude tetraploid genome assembly it's got several like around tens of thousands of scaffolds. Um, but it's useful um, for mapping-based analyses. So I mapped to this tetraploid assembly uh, sequencing reads of tetraploids. And what is shown here along the y-axis, along the uh, vertical axis, are these different scaffolds and the mapping depth is shown in color. And you can see here the the high density at the, of mapping depth is, is 2x, so it's scaled to be 2x. And you can see all of these tetraploids here, these are different species, and they have similar mapping depths across all these scaffolds. But then if you take diploid sequencing data and you map it to these scaffolds, you find that the diploids, they have about 2x mapping depth to part of those scaffolds, but there are many scaffolds that are red, and red means essentially no mapping there. So we're dealing with allotetraploids that are all similar to one another, and with diploids where a part of their genome is very similar, presumably to one of the uh, allotetraploid subgenomes. And there's a different part here um, that's present in those allotetraploids, but not in the diploids. And um, so the interpretation would be that we deal with a situation like here, the allotetraploid subgenomes are quite diverged, Tetma suggests there's a subgenome divergence of 
about 5% on the nuclear type level. Um, but then based on mapping depth and mapping based analyses, the divergence between this shared subgenome, which is present in mutational forest and the diploids is only 0.2%. All right, so this is about, um, was about gamma spectra and estimating uh, population parameters from them. Um, and the second part of the talk is about genome size and composition. And that's a paper that's come out this year. Um, and this is where I thought about, well, can we use KMAS to look into differences between individuals? Um, we knew that in Euphrasia, if you look at multiple individuals of the same species and of the same ploidy level, there's quite a range in genome size. So you might find up to 20% genome size differences within the same species, within the same ploidy level. And I wondered what sequences are these? And it's obviously quite expensive to generate high quality long read data and assemble genomes that are large and compare them. So I thought, perhaps it's possible to use KMAS to look at this. So usually, if we look at KMAS spectra, we look at this monoploid and diploid peak, or the heterozygous and homozygous peak, and then the KMAS spectrum is cut off here. Um, but if you think about genomic repeats that are there in hundreds or thousands of copies, these KMAS, they would show further on the right here. And so what you can do is you can visualize a full KMAS spectrum by showing these x-axis here on a log scale. And here there are actually both axes locked. And it's actually quite beautiful to do this because this kind of KMAS spectrum contains information on both the heterozygosity and on um, where along the sort of range of copy numbers there are very abundant sequences. So in this example here, we can see there's a little peak at 4x. So Presumably, this is a diploid individual. So, presumably, some segmental duplication parts. You can see there. Perhaps you can see there's another little peak here. If you go further along here, uh, depending on species, you may have additional peaks, um, for instance, corresponding to ribosomal DNA or to um, centromeric satellites. And then if you don't filter it out, you also see a clustered DNA and mitochondrial DNA as an, as an additional thing there. But um, I wanted to compare individuals and that's not so easy. So if you use multiplicity, multiplicity depends on sequencing depth and that will differ between individuals. So you can't just take multiplicity values. What I show here in gray is multiplicity converted into genomic copy number. So here's two X, that's homozygous regions here is 4x. Uh, but you can't just divide the multiplicity values um, by the sequencing depth um, because these are discrete values. And if you divide, if you have two individuals with different sequencing depth, these values won't matter. So what I came up with is um, it's useful to bin these, these counts here rather than saying we have 100,000 or 1 million different levels of KMF frequencies, we generate some bins uh, that, that group these observations together. Um, and the thing about these bins is that they go, get wider as you go into the higher copy number ranges. So for instance, here, bin number eight always corresponds to sequences that are observed once in the genome. Bin number 15 corresponds to things observed twice. Um, but then if you have something that's observed a hundred times, that's in bin number 56, and a thousand times is in bin number 80. So between 100 and 1,000, there are only 24 bins, but between 1 and 2x, there are seven bins. So these bins get wider. Um, and this is useful because these bins are the same no matter what individual you sequence, no matter what is your sequencing depth. Um, and you can then compare these binned scaled KMO spectra. And that's what I show here. So this is the comparison, again, of two of these eyebright individuals. There are two different species, both of them are diploid. And what's shown here is the difference between two of these scaled and binned spectra. And not only is the difference shown, but also this is a cumulative sum. So as you go to the right, we sum up these differences that are observed. 
in the genome size in any of these specific things. And what you can see is as you go along, there's an uptick here that crosses 1x, so that crosses the, the heterozygous state. So that suggests that the individual that we subtract here, if it's your Anglica, it's got lower heterozygosity. First individual has a higher heterozygosity, and so we observe more heterozygous candidates. But then if you go into the homozygous canis, there's a down tick here, which makes sense if they both have the same genome size and one is more heterozygous and it's bound to be less homozygous. So Anglica has more of those homozygous canis and there's a down tick here. And then you can go along and you observe that essentially across the board of genome uh, repetitive classes, you find more KMAS in uh, the first individual, Euphrasia roscoviana than Euphrasia anglica. And so these differences add up. And at the end, you end up with an overall genome size difference of about 230 megabase pairs. So this is a useful way of comparing genomes irrespective of the actual contents. This con compares literally only how repetitive are genomes and are the repeats abundant in sort of lower repetitivity classes or higher repetitivity classes? You can do this comparing a human genome to an Arabidopsis genome if you want to. But it might also be interesting to have an analysis that is aware of KMA identity. And that's where you can use two dimensional KMA spectrum. And again, the two dimensional KMA spectrum is not a new invention. People have used these before. Um, but the way I'm using this differently here is that this two-dimensional KMA spectrum is binned. So rather than having counts that go up to 100,000 here, these are actually about 150 bins. And the advantage there is that you can essentially summarize the information in entire genomes in a matrix here that has about 150 times 150 elements, which is manageable on a computer if you think you left all these individual account levels separate, you would have a matrix with 100,000 times 100,000 elements, and that would become unmanageable even if you use sparse matrices. There are many uh, non-zero elements here. So this, even though it's labeled going up to 100,000, these are just 150 bins. And then you can say similar things about this plot. You show both information about heterozygosity. For instance, this individual here, Roscoviana, Euphrasia Roscoviana, um, has high density of KMS here at the 1x level. So this is a more heterozygous individual, whereas this individual here, Euphrasia anglica, doesn't have such high density of KMS at the 1x level. So this is a less heterozygous individual. And then you can go along this diagonal line here into the higher copy number regions. And you see there, going along the spur here, that it lies largely above the diagonal line. So the interpretation there is, if you look at these high copy number KMAS, they're actually more abundant in Roscoviana than they are in Euphrasia Anglica. And that's part of the reason why Roscoviana has a larger genome size, about 1,200 megabase pairs of compared to only one gigabase pair in Anglica. And you can also pick out specific signals like this blob here, this green thing that lies above the diagonal line. And we will see that in the next slide. Rather than doing this analysis for the whole genome, you can pick out, for instance, ribosomal DNAs and visualize this. And uh, I have to ask you to ignore the red and green bits down here. The high density are the blues. And you can see most of the ribosomal DNA canals are here. And in Anglica, they are about there at copy number 3000. So again, this is a logarithmic axis. But in uh, Roscoviana, there are there at about copy number 10,000. You can do that for other repeats as well. Angela interspersed transposable elements. A similar pattern here, the spur is above the diagonal line. So you can dissect genomes and ask how, how do they differ in copy number for specific camera fractions. And I did this here for two diploids, but you can, of course, also compare a diploid and a tetraploid. So here we have Anglica, Euphrasia Anglica on the Y, and Arctica on the X axis. And you can see that in Arctica, there are many chemists that you see at high density 
at copy number four, which are present only at copy number two in a diploid individual. And generally, you can see in the in the tetraploids there is a there's a shift here that the spur extends over to the right. There are many cameras that are observed with some copy number in I encounter, but they are there at the, the twice that copy number, I sort of making up a parallel line uh, in this in this logarithm of that one. Okay, and because I'm now mainly working on human data, I'm trying to apply this to human sequencing data, looking into genome size differences in humans, and maybe that's not so interesting for you guys. <laughs> but um, I think it's probably a useful type of analysis to do to quality check sequencing like this. And that's why I'm showing this here. So this is uh, from the so-called genome in a bottle data set where human data sequenced at high coverage and I compared to PAC bio and an Illumina data set. And it turns out that the Illumina data set has some additional sort of line pattern here where there are some cameras that are about 10 times more abundant in these Illumina data than they are in the PAC bio data. So that's probably not a biological thing, um, but that's another way um, or is, a, is another reason why it might be useful to do these joint field camera spectra. Okay, then let me briefly summarize here. Gamma spectra can be used to study patterns of heterozygosity and sort of population statistics. So you can analyze polyploid gamma spectra, for instance, with the Tetma that I introduced. And then you can also use chemists to look into variation in genome size um, and genome composition. Um, and if you want to do that, you need to bin your camera spectra, as I showed you with these um, difference plots and with the joint camera spectrum. And at the moment, I'm working at two technical problems. One is um, estimating high quality genome size estimation from these bin spectra and automating it. And the other thing is, um, if I generate these joint camera spectra, that's a bit tedious. I generate two separate spectra. I dump them. Then there are huge text files, tens of gigabases, uh, and then I join them. But it would be much more convenient to have a camera counter that can simultaneously count cameras from two individuals. Um, and there are people working on this. Um, and so I either wait until this comes out and I can use it, or I um, have to push ahead and, and make it happen myself. That's sort of the two things I'm concerned about the moment. All right. Thanks for listening to me. All right. Well, well thank you, Hannes. That was a, a really cool talk. And um, I've got to yeah, get this running again. I I, I downloaded Tetmer once, and I I need to reanalyze it on some data now that we've got better assemblies. So this was, okay. that was really cool. I, I, I just wanted to say, yes, if you have any problems with the software is there on GitHub, but if, if you need help, please get in touch. Um, Absolutely. Let us see people using this. All right, are there any questions for Hannes? Um, feel free to put your hands up and, and or put them in the chat box. All right, uh, Carl is up first. Hi, Hannes. Um, Thanks for uh, the talk and, and thanks to the organizers for allowing people from the public to uh, attend. I'm coming in from Georgia. Um, I just have a kind of a basic question. I'm, I'm getting involved in these type of analyses in uh, species of orchids, which have massive genomes, like 50 gigabases. So we can't do the assembly, but we want to learn something about the genomes. Um, and so I'm kind of, this is super basic, but I'm kind of accumulating a list of of different types of analyses that I can work with. And, and then we have the genome scope and smudge plot and the things you talked about today. But is it possible to um, do any um, coalescent modeling with KMERS? Um, or can we learn anything about potential phylogenetic um, uh, history uh, between uh, uh, a collection of, of uh, sequences? Yeah, so there are KMER methods. Um, and um, there's this there's this guy in, in California, for instance, Yavash Mirara, um, who works on generating phylogenies from from KMA, um, from KMA data. 
So you can try to build phylogenies from KMI data sets, yes. Um, coalescent modeling, I feel that's a bit of a vague thing. So the, um, this TED map that I develop is, for instance, based on coalescent uh, principles. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what you mean by coalescent modeling. <laughs> So one thing to keep in mind about KMA analysis is that you want to have a relatively high sequencing depth, something like 20x, and that may be limiting if you work with large genomes. Um, usually we tend to say, well, short reads are relatively cheap compared to high quality long reads, um, but I guess that can be limiting if you work with something really, really big. Um, I have a real quick question. Um, have you thought about what this would look like? Uh, and I was trying to think about this while you're talking um, in like a homoploid hybrid species. It seems like it would be, you know, especially the sort of the, the plot that you showed earlier with the, you know, where you have reads don't map basically from one parent to the other. I, I can imagine that you, you could easily make a plot like that to distinguish, um, you know, homoploid hybrids from, or hybrid species from, from other types of uh, admixture, you'd either see a sort of a clean difference probably or not. I was just trying to think about what that would look like. Yeah, it, yeah, it depends, I guess. It, homoploid hybrid, if it's a diploid, um, it may just be a very heterozygous individual, right? It may just look like a very heterozygous individual. Um, so if you want to know whether breaks have happened in chromosomes, whether recombinations happened, then it is actually better to use assembly-based approaches or approaches where you know about linkage between sites. And that's something that at least these kind of approaches here completely ignore. Right. But if you look at the KMA spectrum, you may still get some indication if there's a huge level of heterozygosity, it suggests that the genomes are very different, as you might expect if it's a homoploid hybrid. Yeah. Yeah, I was just interested. Yeah, I, I might email you later. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions for Hannes? Uh, if not, I know there was a, a some lingering questions for Brian if uh, we're running pretty far over time but if anybody wants to go ahead and ask any open questions uh, from either Hannes or Brian I think feel free to do so. Uh, Sritama yeah I know you had a question left for Brian. <laughs> yes go ahead. I did. Uh, hi Brad thank you for the talk it is really nice to see like because there are not as many work on population at, at population level, there are so the works are on interspecific level. So it was really nice. So uh, one thing that I uh, saw in your presentation, the traits that you chose, it had seed surface area that showed a, quite a lot of changes, right, with polyploidization, and you also had fruit size, but that did not show much change. But like logically, seeds and fruits are related. So do you know like why that thing happened or like why did you get that sort of result? Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question. I, we did take two measures of the fruit, fruit length and fruit width. So very simple. Fruit width provided virtually no information. <laughs> uh, there was very little variation among genotypes or among ploidy levels. Uh, so often when I reported you know, nine of 10 traits showing a certain effect, it was almost always fruit width that showed nothing. Um, and in, from, from some of our analyses, we actually ended up not including it. But why? It's not really clear. I mean, fruit length did show some uh, sensitivity to whole genome duplication. So we did see that. Um, but there was still uh, a large amount of the variance that was associated with uh, variation among individuals within an independent line. Uh, and, and so that's where most of the variation was. And why that is, it's not, it's not really clear to me. We didn't anticipate that. Um, but yeah, I would say we still, we still found the basic patterns showing up with fruit length. It was just fruit width. Uh, 
that wasn't. And that's surprising given that seed size was actually so different uh, between the two ploidy levels. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I can't explain at this point, except that there's other tissue, right? The, the fruit wall that maybe isn't isn't changing as much or it's changing in a compensatory sort of way so that we're not seeing the the difference in seed size showing up in terms of total fruit width. Okay, yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, oh, uh, is that uh, Hannes with the question? Yeah, Ryan, uh -oh. yeah, very, very cool talk. I, I really enjoyed um, the experimental design and it's really great that it's possible to do this with this sort of replication so much genetic, um, different genetic lines. So this striking pattern of, uh, if you have a diploid that's extreme in some way, and then you look at the tetraploid and it tends to be not extreme. That's a bit reminiscent of this statistical thing, the uh, sort of the, the winner's curse or the sophomore slump, right? Where you see an individual that's really successful and that's so because it is good, but also it's a bit lucky. Um, and if you look at ah. it again next year, it's still good, but probably it isn't lucky in the next year. Um, and I wonder if this might play a role in your observation there, right? You have replication, I think. These dots weren't single individuals, I reckon. But I still wonder- they were, the, they were the product of eight individuals. Hmm. Um, so, but you're saying it might be sort of a statistical anomaly, basically that just uh, by chance we saw that, but it might not be repeatable. Right. It's just reminiscent of that. I don't know if it matters. I don't know if it's, you know, if you think hard about it, you can probably say, oh, it's not a concern or I need to look into this. It's, it's just that it, it looked similar to that. Um, Are you thinking of a particular result that, that I, you know, where you saw that? Um, was it just looking at the variation amongst the diploids or was it the the effect of the whole genome duplication where you you yeah. sort of made that observation? So I recall this these sort of plots where you show the phenotype in the diploid and the, you show the lock change compared to the tetraploid. Right. Um, and if you had diploids that were extreme by chance, but it's not a genetic thing, right? Then the tetraploid would just be average and then you would see this sort of, it could be simulated, I guess. Or, I don't know. Yeah, I see. I hadn't thought of that, and maybe it's because we did uh, try to maximize replication within individual cytotypes or, or genotypes. So both the diploid and the tetraploids of every genotype were, were at least we started with uh, AG. I think that a few cases, a couple of them died, but um, but when you do get an extreme diploid phenotypes, uh, I think that the the issue is that sometimes they produce an even more extreme tetraploid phenotype. But other times they don't, they produce a less extreme. So uh, it, it kind of depends on the phenotype that we measured. But I guess I, I'm curious to know how I might kind of explore that further because it's an, an interesting idea. I don't know, I would have to do a bit more thinking about that. Um, yeah, interesting. The other, the other thing in relation to that is if it is, if it's not just a statistical thing that just shows up, it feels a bit like there is something that's heritable in some way, but not genetic. Like, is there mm. something that's lost? Is it some small RNAs that make them big? And then if they're tetraploid and the colchicine messes everything up, then you probably thought about that. Uh, well, at this point, we haven't excluded that. There's certainly, you know, lots of evidence for, uh, you know, structural changes or epigenetic changes that might influence the phenotype of the, the polyploid. We, we started by just looking at straight sort of patterns of gene expression, especially as it relates to days to flower. But I, I, I don't think we can exclude uh, those other things. Um, certainly, you know, the first thing we looked at was uh, estimates of genome size for the tetraploids that were derived from each diploid. And we, we couldn't find any evidence of anomalies in terms of the total uh, 
mass of DNA, it was exactly where it should have been. But that obviously is a pretty crude measure. And it would be interesting to know whether other changes were occurring when that duplication happens. Uh, so yeah, I think that we can't discount that at this point. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank both uh, Brian and Hannes for two really wonderful talks today. Uh, I, I have some cool questions for, for both of you. I'll, I'll probably follow up uh, offline. Uh, we're running pretty far over. Um, but those are those are really, really exciting uh, uh, and new stuff for me personally. So I, I, I think everyone else uh, also found some, some really wonderful things in there to, uh, to hear about. Um, uh, new things to hear about polybody. Um, before I, I do wrap up, I want to just highlight that uh, here at the end that we have a polyploidy meeting coming up in 2023 that'll take place in uh, Florida, uh, May 9th to the 13th. Um, uh, there's a link there. The website is polyploidconference.org. Uh, so feel free to check that out. I know it's still kind of coming together, um, but there's a, some dates and a location uh, uh, and some um, information to sign up for the mailing list to, to receive information about that. I also want to highlight that we're uh, also doing another issue of uh, a joint issue of American Journal of Botany and uh, Apps, the Application of Plant Sciences from the BSA. Uh, we're uh, running two special issues on polyploidy, um, and we currently have a call for papers out. So uh, there's also a link there. So if you have uh, a, a tool or a review or some cool results that you want to write about, um, there should be a, a, this is a great opportunity to do so uh, in either AJB or apps. Uh, and I believe the, the, our call for papers is due at the end of January. So you have some time to, to think about that um, and put together uh, a submission to, to this special issue. Uh, and I encourage folks to do that. All right. Um, we'll see everyone back here in the new year in 2023. Um, on January 11th, we'll hear from David Wickle uh, as well as uh, Adam Sessions. So, uh, tune in then. Um, everyone have a, a wonderful uh, holiday season and happy new year. Uh, and we'll see everyone on, on the other side of that. All right. Thank you. And again, thank you to Brian and, and Hannes for two wonderful talks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much.